Okay, Boker Tov, Sarayim Tovim, Erev Tov, depending on where you live, it's a pleasure to welcome everybody and to welcome back Dr. Schwartz, P Professor Schwartz, uh, to give after his one-part talk on Hanukkah, we invited him back for now a four-part series on uh, anti-Semitism in the ancient world and modern anti-Semitism, and it's a, a pleasure to have him. Dr. Schwartz is uh, the Herbst Family Professor of Judaic Studies at Hebrew University, born in Syracuse, which was the farm team of the Toronto Blue Jays for many years, if I can say that. And he's been living in Israel since 1971 and been teaching at Hebrew University, I think for close to 50 years already, been teaching at Hebrew U. And he's uh, really one of the world's experts in uh, ancient ancient Judaism. And it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome him back to Torah in Motion for the beginning of our four-part series. Vakasha, Professor Schwartz. Thank you very much. Can you, yes, you can hear me? Yes, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to give this series. Uh, I'll start just with a little correction. I've been teaching at the Hebrew University for uh, 41 years now, but I've been in the same department where I began my BA studies for 50 years uh, in Jewish history at Hebrew University, and uh, basically my whole life since a year after high school, I've been here in the very same department, and I don't regret it at all. Uh, most of what I do has to do with ancient Jewish history. Uh, that's what I teach, that's my field. Uh, but ancient Jewish history is something which you teach among other ways, or you study among other ways by looking and seeing what modern historians have written about things. You don't have to invent everything yourself. And sometimes like what I did on Hanukkah when I talked about Heinemann and Bickerman, sometimes you start wondering why this or that modern historian does things this or that way and what implications this has. So I'm going to be giving you a series of four lectures about various episodes basically, or aspects of ancient Jewish history. In each case, I'll point out what it is that ticked me off and got me onto something of a um, digression, which turned out to be greater or lesser. And the one I'm going to be talking about today turned into a book uh, about um, what it is that underlies modern attitudes and modern understandings of more ancient things. So I'll start now with a, um, a PowerPoint. Uh, let's see, how do I do this? I do it like this. Okay, and then I... You can see my picture of Heinrich Gretz, of whom I'm sure you've heard. Gretz is one of the very few people who until today has written in a detailed way the entire history of the Jewish people up to his own day. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a very picayune problem that I noticed in Gretz. You'll see it in a moment. And what it took me off onto uh, until finally understanding something which I summarized in an article, which I listed at the bottom of the screen, an article about how do you get from feuding medievalists now, the refuting modern scholars who deal with medieval Jewish history to the Berlin Antisemitismus Streit of, 19, of 1879, which, as you'll see a few minutes from now, was a major watershed on the way along to the Holocaust. Uh, so I'll just start off. This will be something of a wide ranging lecture, and I will do it as best I can in the time which I have assigned to me. My field, I said, is ancient Jewish history. I was asked several years ago to write a survey of what modern Jewish historians have written about Josephus, uh, which has a history of its own. And while I was doing that, I noticed a superfluous comma, which is what the screen will show you. What you see here on top of the screen is <clears throat> a photocopy from the 1878 edition of the third volume of Gretz's History of the Jews. The third volume discusses the latter half of the second temple period, including the first century when Josephus lived. And in the course of writing what he writes here, I came across the following sentence. I don't know, I won't assume that you know how to read German. If you do, you can see it there in German, but I rendered this in English because of this ambiguous comma attitude he paralyzed the movement instead of pushing it forward. We're talking about Josephus's role as a Jewish general in the rebellion against Rome in the year 66 
and 67. And Gretz complains that because of his ambiguous attitude, he wasn't really sure was he for the Jews or for the Romans, he paralyzed the Jewish rebellious movement rather than moving it forward. And in the course of this text, there's a comma which shouldn't be there, which I've reflected in my translation. <clears throat> and I didn't just shrug my shoulder at the comma, but rather I went to see what, what might have generated such a comma. And you know commas can be there by for all sorts of reasons, including simply random mistakes. But when I got out the previous edition of Gretz's history, which came out in 1863, I saw that what it said was because of this ambiguous treasonous attitude, he paralyzed the movement instead of pushing it forward. And in that text, the comma is totally justified in German style. What he means is because of this ambiguous and treasonous attitude, but it's perfectly good German style to use a comma there. And what we can therefore see is that between, in preparing the 1878 edition, Gretz erased the characterization of Josephus as being treasonous. But in doing so, he didn't erase the comma or the guy who worked in the print shop didn't notice that he should erase the comma. One way or the other, the comma remained as an indication that Gretz has been upgrading his image of Josephus by removing the accusation that Josephus was a traitor. Many of you might be familiar with that common accusation that Josephus was treasonous. Gretz had it in 1863 and he left it out in 1878. Once I noticed that I started looking through these two editions more systematically and I noticed that in several cases, these are a few of them, he similarly upgraded his characterization of Josephus. So in 1863, in one of the pages, he talks about Josephus as leaning towards the nation's enemies. It doesn't reappear in 1878. At one point, he records, he repeats Josephus' own claim that Josephus, when he was general in the Galilee, admitted to the, the Jewish aristocrats of uh, Tiberias, the city of Tveria, that he knew that they could not withstand Rome. In other words, Josephus was defeatist when he was supposed to be the Jewish general against Rome. And in 1878, Gretz records that Josephus stated that, but he said Josephus' statement was not true. In other words, he claimed that Josephus, after the rebellion, felt the need to portray himself as having been defeatist, but he really wasn't a traitor in the course of the rebellion. Similarly, Josephus reports in his autobiography in Life 78 that he instructed his soldiers not to fight the Romans, which would be treasonous, and Gretz omits this as well in 1878. So across the board, and there's more, and I wrote an article about that, which I listed on the bottom. Across the board, Josephus is engaged in upgrading Josephus, particularly in erasing the notion that Josephus had been treasonous. And I started wondering why. And the first thing that I noticed is that, oh, this goes together with some change that Gretz silently made in the title of his book. Namely, in 1856, the first volume of this work came out. Every volume in Gretz's series has the same left-hand title page for the whole series, which is it's the history of the Jews, Geschichte der Juden, from the most ancient times until the present. And the right-hand title page gives you the name of this particular volume of the 11 volumes. So this one in 1856 was from the death of Judas Maccabeus until the end of the Jewish state. Geschichte der Juden, from the death of Judah Maccabee until the end of the Jüdischen Status, the Jewish state. So it was in 1856. So it was in 1863, exactly the same way. But in 1878, the volume which I began with, the third edition, it has become the history of the Judeans, no longer Yudin. The whole series is Yudin, but this particular volume, when they have a state, the Hasmonean state, is the history of the Judeans from the death of Judah Maccabee until the end of the Judean 
state. He has changed both of these from Jewish to Judean. And you wonder why. And I started thinking about what might have made a guy upgrade Josephus from being treasonous to not being treasonous and to start talking about Judean state instead of Jewish state. And I knew someplace from the back of my mind, things I had learned that Goetz had been the main object of attack in what is known as the Berlin anti-Semitism conflict of 1879 to 1881. A German professor by the name of Heinrich von Treitschke, I'll say a little bit more about him in a moment, attacked Gretz and attacked the Jews more generally as being treasonous because they aren't really loyal to the German state. And we're talking about the first decade of the unified German state, we're talking about the days of Bismarck, the German Reich, which began in 1871. And the Jews are being accused of being not really loyal citizens of the German state. And maybe Gretz, I thought, was sensitive about Jewish traitors. He doesn't want to admit that any Jews were ever traitors. And he might also be that when he's talking about the time when the Jews undeniably had a state, at least he can say it wasn't a Jewish state. It was a Judean state which makes it a little bit easier to claim that you then Jews have no other state than their German state. Yes, once upon a time, 2000 years before that, the Judeans had a state, but that's not relevant to the question of the loyalty of the Juden to the German Staat, the German state. So that occurred to me as an hypothesis. And I knew that the German, the anti-Semitism conflict was a big deal. Here you have, for example, the first volume of two big volumes collecting the materials related to the Berliner Antisemitismus Streit, the Berlin Antisemitismus Conflict. It's a major public debate between 1879 and 1881 about the status of the Jews in Germany. Should they be accepted as citizens? Are they willing to be accepted as citizens? Are they willing to be loyal as citizens or not? But the issue which I began with was why did Gretz make various changes in an 1878 volume? And I can't really explain that on the basis of something that only began in 1879. So that is a problem. You're with me? Okay, if you have questions, say so. What happened? Something got lost, okay. If they had a conference in 1879, it didn't start in 1879. It broke out this, this anti-Semitism strike began in 1879. But no, but that's when they had the conference. Conflict. Conflict, oh. This is a conflict, it it's something which is all over the newspapers. What, this, what these okay. volumes are full of newspapers and separate pamphlets, uh, little booklets, everybody's writing pro and con, the Jews and their status in, in Germany, and it was in 1879. The guy who started it was Heinrich von Treitschke, who was a very, very important German professor. He was a public figure. He wasn't just a professor of German history. He was a professor of German modern history. And in that capacity, he was also a very political and very public figure. Here you see, for example, he's got four volumes which come out of his historical and political articles. And this is a later edition. They were coming out through all these years. He writes, five volumes of history of German, his German history in the 19th century. He's the editor of sort of highbrow journals, which are coming out, but they're popular journals. The Preußische Jahrbücher is something which, uh, something like, um, oh, I don't know, uh, Times Literary Supplement, something like that. Uh, people, important people read these things. And he's also the editor of the Historische Zeitschrift, which is the professional journal of historians. And he is the one who began this conflict about the Jews by writing an article in November 1879 in the Preußische Jahrbücher, which he edited. It's called Unsere Aussichten, which would um, in English would be Our Prospects. And 
It's an article which attacks the Jews as being people who are not at all loyal to the German state, but they're taking all the advantages of being citizens. They're inundating the German state by coming in from Poland. This is the article that has the famous phrase about the infamous phrase about the country being over, uh, taken over by trouser selling Jews coming in from Poland. Uh, Jewish peddlers are taking over the country. Even in the best educated circles among men who would reject with horror any thought of Christian fanaticism or national arrogance. Even, though, even among liberal people, we hear today the cry as from one mouth, the Jews are our misfortune, which in German is the Juden sind unser Unglück, which, as you know, is the slogan which appeared on every edition of Der Stürmer in the Nazi period. So it's very easy to make a straight line from this Berlin antisemitismus strike, this Berlin conflict about Judaism to the Holocaust. Well, it's a big deal. It's a major historical event. You'll see it as we go on. That which made Treitschke go out and attack the Jews was his reading of Gretz. There's a letter from von Treitschke, which has been published in the summer of 1879. He's in the Swiss mountains. And he's writing a friend of him and uh, for this, and he's saying, up here in the Swiss mountains, I've read the 11th volume of Gretz Geschichte der Juden. The 11th volume is the one on contemporary history, 1750 to 1848. It's the volume in which Gretz praises the French for emancipating the Jews and he attacks the Germans for dragging their legs about that or even doing the opposite of that. And von Treitschke writes, up here in the Swiss mountains, I've read the 11th volume of Gretz, the Geschichte der Juden, can hardly find words to express my disgust. He writes this in the summer of 1879 and by November of 1879, he's publishing this major attack of the Jews on the Jews, which ticks off this major controversy that went on for two years. So now I have two puzzles. How could Gretz be responding to von Treitschke if Gretz's third edition appeared in 1878, well before von Treitschke's volume, von Treitschke's article appeared? And the other one is where did von Treitschke get a copy of the 11th volume of Gretz in the Swiss mountains? I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Swiss mountains, but the local libraries don't have very much. And a guy like von Treitschke probably wasn't the kind of guy who was usually reading this type of stuff. I admit they're not the heaviest questions in the world, but they occurred to me. <clears throat> so one thing I started to do is say, well, maybe Gretz wasn't reacting specifically to von Treitschke's article and the conflict which it engendered, but nevertheless, maybe things like this were in the air already and Gretz was already sensitive to things like that already by 1878. You know, things can be in the air. They don't come from just nowhere. So I started looking to see how early should the roots of the Berlin conflict be located? And I started looking around and I see that historians who've discussed the history of modern German anti-Semitism, they do start somewhat earlier than 1879. For example, if you look here, an article by Yaakov Katz, the preparatory stage of the modern anti-Semitic movement, he begins it in 1873 to 1879. In other words, 1879 is when it really begins. Modern German anti-Semitism really begins in 1879. But Katz says there is a preparatory stage beginning in 1873. Other people point to 1873 as well because there was something of a stock market crash in Berlin in 1873. And some people started blaming the Jews for that. Other people talk about the same thing. Other people talk about a little bit later. So this is the period in which things are happening. So you see indeed there were things in the air, there was anti-Semitism in the air already before 1878 and Gretz could have been reacting to that. Here, for example, you have some examples of some anti-Semitism being in the air 
being out there in the mid 1870s. And this is about the stock market. This is somebody else. Somebody's writing a book here about the victory of, the, of Judaism over Germanism. So these things are out there and we could therefore think Gretz is reacting to them. But not only were there general things about Jews out there before 1878, but there was also specifically an attack on Gretz from the very same point of view in 1871. In January 1871, in the midst of the war between the Prussians and France, at the very time when the empire was being set up a review appeared in 1871 in a very prominent German literary journal. The Literarisches Zentralblatt für Deutschland. This is like Times Literary Supplement, New York Times Review of Books, very prominent periodical of review of books in which there's a three column review of Gretz, the 11th volume of Gretz, the one about the contemporary period and the author is very, very hostile. He condemns Gretz in this book for praising the French and accusing the Germans, which Germans probably wouldn't like altogether, but to do something like that in a book which comes out in the course of a war between Germany and France was really kind of unfortunate. Gretz's volume came out in the spring of 1870. Here it's being reviewed in January of 1871. And it really, uh, was not very productive for Jews to have a book like this coming out, praising Napoleon, praising the French for, for emancipating the Jews and complaining about the Germans. And the review was signed ML. This was common practice in the 19th century to sign book reviews by uh, either leave them totally anonymous or to sign them by initials. You could talk about why, but that's a different story. It was done. Mr. M. L. wrote this very antagonistic review. And when I discovered this, and I realized that this review was accusing Gritz and Jews of Germany in general of being treasonous insofar as they are praising Germany's enemies. They're happy to take German citizenship, but they don't want to be loyal to Germany. And this review in particular ends up with claiming about claiming that Jews en masse avoided service in the Prussian army in the war against Napoleon, because the Jews are simply cowards who would rather not fight for their country. It became interesting for me to find out who ML was. And if before I admitted that one of my questions about where did von Treitschke get a book in the Swiss mountains is kind of trivial question, I admit it's a kind of trivial question. The comma with which I began this whole thing was also a trivial question. Why bother following up a comma? But things happen as you will see. So I started, I wanted to know who ML was. And I saw that <clears throat> the author is particularly interested in, his, in issues of military history. And it turned out to be not very difficult to identify the author as a guy named Max Lehmann. How did I know that? Well, the first point was because he was concentrating on military history. So I went to a military historian at Hebrew University and I asked him who by the name of ML was interested in German military history around 1871. And my friend here at Hebrew University says he doesn't know but he's got a friend at the US Air Force Academy who probably will know. And here's the guy's name. So I sent an email off to this guy in America at the Air Force Academy and said, my friend here says you might know who ML was. And 20 minutes later, I get back this letter. Oh, that would be Max Lehmann. You know, if you ask the right expert, you get the right answer. He gave me the name Max Lehmann and said, he's probably the guy because Max Lehmann wrote, as we shall see, a whole lot of things about military history. Moreover, once you have a name, you can start looking to see what you know about the guy and you can find his published memoirs. He wrote an autobiographical essay and he complains there that when he was 
in his youth, around 25 and 26 and 27 years old, he was spending an awful lot of time writing book reviews for this journal, the Literarische Zentralblatt für Deutschland, because they paid him to write reviews and he was spending too much time doing that, but he had to do that. So this pretty well makes the hypothesis reliable that Max Lehmann was the author of this review because I see his interest in military history and I know he's writing reviews for this journal. But moreover, what I next did is I went through the journal and I located about 30 other reviews written by ML and I read them all because in my experience, it's about impossible that people can't write a whole lot without revealing their identity. And sure enough, without too much work, I ran across a review by ML in the same journal in the same year, 1871, in which he writes a review of a book by Mr. Putz. And ML complains that Mr. Putz signs, excuse me, cites a detailed study but nevertheless ignores the findings of that study. But ML doesn't tell us what that detailed study was. Now, why should he do that? If I want to complain that Rabbi Kelman uh, read some book by John Smith and nevertheless ignores its findings, I would probably tell you the name of the book by John Smith. So you could go and corroborate my accusation. But here the author doesn't tell us what's the name of this detailed study that is quoted by Mr. Prutz and nevertheless its conclusions are ignored. And the usual explanation for that is because the author is being polite. People don't like to complain about other people not reading their own work. If I were to have to write a review of somebody who's writing in my field who didn't quote work that I wrote on the same topic, it would be thought to be impolite for me to complain about that. And that's what ML is doing because as it turns out, you go to Prutz's book to page 401, which he does refer us to, and you see that Prutz is referring us to a book by Lehmann. And Lehmann's doctoral dissertation is about the Cologne Chronicle to which he refers here in his review. So now we are absolutely certain that it was Max Lehmann who wrote the review of Gritz. Okay, what I just described to you took several months of work, but it worked. And now we know that Max Lehmann who wrote his review in 1867, so wrote his doctoral dissertation in 1867, he's the one who wrote the very nasty attack on Gritz in 1871. So now I want to know, well, why is he writing such an angry attack on Gretz and the Jews in 1871? And I started looking to what do I know about Lehman? And I found out two interesting things. First of all, I found out that Lehman had been in close relations with von Treitschke in the course of the 1870s. There are tens of letters which you can find easily in German archives because they have online catalogs that Lehmann sent to von Treitschke, von Treitschke sent to Lehmann. Basically von Treitschke was the professor, asked Lehmann to help him with his work and in return von Treitschke wrote letters of recommendation and helped his friend Lehmann get a job. And here you have, for example, von Treitschke writing his own publisher saying that Lehmann's been helping me Lehmann, when he finally publishes a book, dedicates the book to von Treitschke. When Lehmann got a real job and he left Berlin, they have a going away party. He sits next to von Treitschke. Well, they're good friends. And I know that Lehmann wrote a review of Gretz in 1871 of the same volume of Gretz that later von Treitschke was reading. Yes. So if I asked before, where would von Treitschke get a copy of Gretz's volume? Well, you know how book reviews work. 
the way a book review works is the publisher of the volume sends the volume to a journal. The journal sends it to a reviewer. The reviewer writes a review and whatever other pay the reviewer gets, the reviewer also gets to keep the volume. I have in my room here probably 50 books of which I've written book reviews and I get to keep the volume. Well, it then became interesting to see, well, let's see if I can prove that the copy of Gretz's volume that von Treitschke read was given to him or loaned to him by Lehmann who owned a copy. And lo and behold, a friend of mine, Lehmann eventually was a professor in Göttingen. When professors die, frequently their books come into the library of the university where they were. A friend of mine in Göttingen went down to the stacks and found all of the copies that the library in Göttingen owned of the 11th volume of Gretz's Geschichte and found with no trouble at all, one of them that had Lehmann's penciled marginalia in the side. For example, here you see on page 70 of the volume, you see this comment here in pencil, the Juden sind ein Staat im Staat, the Jews are a state within a state, which is a typically anti-Semitic claim that the Jews don't really take being German seriously. They take the benefits of being Germans, but they really consider themselves members of the Jewish state. That's written here in pencil. And the handwriting is Lehmann's handwriting. My friend went to the archives of the University of Göttingen, found Lehmann's file. You can find any number of things in Lehmann's handwriting and you can confirm this is Lehmann. But before I go on, note that here, for example, you have things in pen as well in the body of the text. You have handwritten comments in pen, in ink. Like over here, gut gelogen, somebody wrote this in pen and it's a different handwriting. Well, <clears throat> I suspected this different handwriting was going to be von Treitschke's handwriting. And what I did is I contacted the guy who put these volumes together. Karsten Krieger was doing a doctorate on the Berliner Antisemitismus Streit, and he was an expert in the archival remains of von Treitschke. So I got this copy of Gretz together with Carmen K Karsten Kirsten. And he sat down with the book and there are numerous comments like this in handwriting. And he told me with 100% security, these are von Treitschke's comments. Okay. Which means that if I go now and say that one can draw a straight line from von Treitschke's article against Gretz to Der Stürmer and to modern German anti-Semitism. And I say that the historians all begin modern German uh, anti-Semitism with 1879, but it has some antecedents. Now I can say that the way it began, the way that article was written by von Treitschke results directly and only from the fact that his sidekick, Lehmann, who was his friend in the 1870s, happened to review a copy of Gretz in 1871. Otherwise, the copy that von Treitschke read, which ticked him off against the Jews, would never have come to him. He got Lehmann's copy. And not only did he get Lehmann's copy, but he also got Lehman's review. The way people work, I'm just looking to see what time it is. Yes, the way people work, the way reviewers work, anybody who's familiar with big university libraries knows this. When somebody reviews a book, typically the author of the review folds up a copy of the review in his own copy of the book. So then when the guy takes the book off the shelf, he can also refresh his memory. What is it that I wrote about that book? And when these books eventually come into the university library, when you open them up, you will very often find the reviewers review inside of the book. And what you have here 
on the left. I'm not going to go into all the German with you. I'm just telling you that all of the words that are in bold print on the left in von Treitschke's 1879 article come straight out of Lehman's review of the same book in 1871. And some of these words are special words. They're not just any old words. To talk about Übersetzt, namely overestimated the importance of something, where here you have Zelps Übersetzt, so self over, overestimating one's own importance. This is not the kind of word that everybody uses all the time. To give examples for what you're complaining about by reference to Berna and to Heine and to Lessing, just like Lehmann did, is something which we can best understand as having come to von Treitschke from Lehmann, who lent him the book, showed him the review, and when von Treitschke read this book already, he was being guided in his reading of it by what his friend, his assistant, Lehmann had already pointed out. So now the question becomes, excuse me, my, my conclusion first of all is, if we want to understand what then engendered von Treitschke's 1879 attack on the Jews, which is what rendered the birth of respectable German anti-Semitism. This is the way it's usually considered. It made German anti-Semitism something respectable for people could do, could be. They took it out of the gutter, brought it into the universities, into high-class journalism. We have to understand various things. We have to understand why did Lehmann write the way he wrote about Gritz and the Jews late in 1870. His review appeared in, 18, in January of 1871, so he must have written it late in 1870. And this got me interested in then seeing what do we know about Lehmann, who in the end was a professor of modern German history in Göttingen. But that already should surprise you because you remember that he wrote his doctorate on an 11th century Cologne Chronicle in Latin. How do you get from that, from a doctorate in medieval German history to being a professor of modern German history. It's a very striking question. And here, I'm, I'm an historian. I, I can probably appreciate this more readily than a lot of you, but each one of you knows you have a profession. We're talking about a massive change in profession. Here's a guy who wrote his dissertation in 1867 on a Latin chronicle. He wrote his dissertation in Latin. The chronicle is of 11th century Cologne. And then he starts writing, beginning in 1875, he's writing about the Freiheitskriege, that's the German war against Napoleon, the beginning of the 19th century. He's writing here a book about generals in the German-Prussian war against um, France, Napoleon. He's writing here about Prussia and the Catholic Church since 1640. He's writing a book about the main German general in the war against Napoleon. He's writing a book about Frederick the Great. He's writing a book about the revolution of 1813. He's writing a book about Bismarck. How does this happen? What makes somebody move away from high medieval history into totally contemporary for him, German history? And here you see it even more uh, fully. I have a list here of his publications. The first one has to do with this Cologne Chronicle of the 12th and 13th century. Then he wrote an article about the 10th century. And after that, everything is about the 18th century, the 19th century. These are the topics of things he's writing. Something changed radically. And for a guy like me, especially perhaps an historian, I wanna know what makes somebody change his field of study so radically. So I start reading about Lehmann, and you realize maybe there's no particular answer. But what you immediately find out is something which makes the question all the more interesting. What you immediately find out is that Lehmann's advisor for the doctorate, which for the Germans is called the Dr. Vater, his father, insofar as he's a scholar, was Jewish. There was a guy named Philip Jaffe, 
this picture over here on the right, who was the first Jewish professor at the University of Berlin apart from medicine. He was a very prolific scholar. We'll see something of this in a minute. And he committed suicide in April of 1870. And this, you can imagine, when I discovered this, got me interested. What makes a Jewish historian commit suicide in April of 1870? What makes the student of a Jewish professor write so hostily about Jews just a few months later when he's writing his review of Gritz? And it simply got me into this and it got me into it and got me into it. And eventually I wrote a book about it. So I really got sidetracked by this and I got into uh, a 19th century issue and eventually found a couple hundred letters by Philip Yaffe and I published them as well. And what I'm telling you now has to do with things I discovered along that route. And I have another 20 minutes or something to do it. I think I can do it. Yeah, all right, 18 minutes it says. I will simply point out that what I'm going to tell you illustrates something which Kaplan and McGee wrote in a book on the academic marketplace, that academic feuding deserves investigation. Historians are people, flesh and blood with feelings, and sometimes they feud. And I'm going to tell you now about a feud between Jaffe and Georg Heinrich Pertz, who as you see was a generation or so older than Jaffe. And Pertz was a big shot. Pertz was the head of the project called the Monumenta Germaniae Historica, namely the historical monuments of Germany, a huge publishing project which exists until today, basically publishing Latin texts of the Middle Ages that are pertinent to German history a research center which was bigger and smaller in different generations. By now it's published hundreds of volumes. And to begin with, Jaffe worked for Pertz for a decade. Jaffe was in touch with Pertz. Pertz was also a librarian. Pertz helped Jaffe because they're in the same field, medieval German history. Jaffe dedicated a book to him. He thanks him here and there. He works for him. But their feud began in 1862 after Jaffe, who had been working all these years as basically a postdoctoral research assistant, got an offer of a real job to run a archives in Florence in Italy, and Pertz torpedoed that. Probably Pertz didn't want to give up on a good worker. He torpedoed the job. Jaffe quit in a huff. Jaffe got he quit in a huff after his friends, including Theodor Mommsen, who I will talk about in another lecture as well, one of the major, major names of German historical scholarship, got the Nobel Prize, the only historian who ever got a Nobel Prize. There is, Nobel Pri there is no Nobel Prize for history, but there is for literature, and Mommsen got that. They set up a job for Jaffe as a professor in the University of Berlin. He quit. And for the next several years, Jaffe and Pertz are feuding with each other, writing nasty footnotes against each other, writing nasty reviews against each other, writing um, letters defaming one another, including to the government. And here you see, for example, a public broadside, the type of thing people pass out on street corners when they don't have uh, Facebook they, this is the way they would do it. Jaffe actually published a broadside in May of 1869, complaining that Pertz had been claiming that Jaffe worked for the German secret police. And he ends this with, I hereby declare the man who created the libel against my honor, my era, detailed at the opening of this document, no matter who he is, to be a dishonorable slanderer. Now, this is what you would say, these are fighting words. This is the equivalent of people challenging another person to a duel in a Western. These guys were at each other's throats for years. Beginning in 1864, Jaffe started publishing his own volumes that are competing directly with the Monumenta. 
Peretz, you remember, was the head of the project, edited by Peretz, of volumes of medieval German history, Bibliotheca, excuse me, Monumenta Germania Historica. A year after he quits in 1864, Jaffe starts publishing his Bibliotheca Rerum Germanicarum, his library of German things, German books. And he's competing directly with Peretz. He's calling his own volumes Monumenta. And he does things like this. He publishes in his monument, in his Bibliotheca, some of the same texts that Peretz has already published in his collection. And he explains to readers just how bad Peretz's editions are. So I have to do it again. Here, for example, he complains that Peretz's edition of something is the most wretched one that ever appeared. And says, unless you imagine I'm doing this without any basis, I'll give you a long list of Peretz's mistakes. And so they're feuding. Now Lehmann had been Yafe's student. Yafe was Lehmann's doctor father. He was guiding him, he was advising him towards his doctorate. Pertz had been running the Monumenta, but he was getting old. He was born in 1795. Pertz expected his own son, Carl, who was also a medieval study, to inherit him as the head of the Monumenta. Carl wrote an 1861 edition of a certain text. Lo and behold, Lehman sat down at Yafe's behest and wrote his dissertation on the same text in 1867. And the main point of the dissertation was that Carl Peretz's edition was terrible, was negligent, was sloppy, was not professional. It was a hatchet job. Lehman's dissertation, which we saw before, was a hatchet job on the dissertation by Peretz's son. And in March of 1870, in March of 1870, <clears throat> this is simply amazing to, to read things like this, Lehman published, again, signed only ML, but those in the know knew who he was, a review of a book by Pertz Sr., Georg Pertz, who remember was born in 18, excuse me, 1795. This whippersnapper, Lehman, born a full 50 years after um, Pertz, publishes a review which begins by saying, this volume too fails to belie the well-known vices of Peretzian historical writing. He just, this, this guy opens his review with both barrels. What's the word? I forgot the expression. He's shooting from both barrels. But this feud was going on, it was going on. There were nasty reviews, there were nasty letters, there were nasty machinations of all sorts. I told you I wrote a book about this. And by the end of March, 1870, just a couple of weeks after this review by Lehman appeared, Yaffe couldn't take it anymore. And he went off to Wittenberge, which is outside of Berlin, stayed there for a few days, bought a revolver and killed himself. And Yaffe committed suicide at the beginning of April, 1870 about three weeks after this review appeared. Leaving Lehmann, therefore, an orphan. His doctor Vater was dead. The only other place in the world that had any jobs for people who were specialists in editing medieval Latin texts pertaining to Germany was run by Peretz. And there was no way that Peretz was going to consider employing Lehmann after Lehmann had written so nastily about Pertz and about Pertz's son. So Lehmann has to start looking for another way to survive. Lehmann has to start looking for another way to make a living. <clears throat> and Lehmann starts writing book reviews for the journal that we've already seen. 
And in the summer of 1870, four months after Yaffe dies, you can find a letter in the archives in which Lehman complains to the editor of the journal, just now I saw that my initials ML were omitted from my review of Trotsky's historical and political essays in the August 6th issue of your journal, although they were explicitly given in the manuscript. In other words, I've sent them in. You should have published them and you failed to publish my initials. You would be doing me a great favor if you could bring them to your reader's attention in the next issue. This is extraordinarily important for me for I wish to show the contents of my review all around. This is a very pathetic letter. Lehman has written a very, very flattering review. This is the letter in transcription. Lehman has written a very, very flattering review of von Treitschke. We'll see it in a minute. And it doesn't say in the review that he's the author. And he wanted to show this letter, this review all around. He wants people to know I'm the guy who wrote so nicely about von Treitschke. Why does he want people to know that he wrote so nicely about von Treitschke? Because he's looking for a new patron. His old patron just committed suicide. This guy needs somebody who's solid, somebody who has access to funds, somebody who has influence, who can take him under his wings. He wrote a very, very flattering review of von Treitschke, we'll see it in a moment. And now it appeared without his name. How can he tell people he's the author of this? Look how flattering it is. True, it's no longer the case that what many of our scholars know about Heinrich von Treitschke is only that he's a Prussian leading and not untalented publicist. The rise of his reputation is best documented by the flood of hatred with which he is persecuted wherever the German state which is seeking to assert itself has enemies. He's saying the German state and von Treitschke, they go together. But only in the future will it be possible to appreciate his worth fully. Then even the most stubborn radical who today makes the sign of the cross whenever he hears von Treitschke's name will join us in the conviction that since the days of Wilmer von Hutten such a voice has not been sounded in Germany. Heinrich von Treitschke surpasses this and that, surpasses this and that, yes, we can hardly imagine anything more exciting. This is pure flattery, which Lehman published. And he was upset that his name didn't appear, but he found other ways. This is what it looks like in the German. He found other ways. And as we saw, ah, where did we see it? Um, Sorry. We saw that indeed in the course of the 1870s, Lehman did manage to become very close to von Treitschke. And accordingly, when von Treitschke was going off to vacation in 1879, and he was writing his books about the most recent history of Germany, and he wanted to have something to read about the Jews, his sidekick, Lehman was able to lend him a copy of a book on modern Jewish history, along with his own review. That book angered von Treitschke so much that he sat down and wrote his article attacking the Jews. He attacks Gretz in particular, he attacks the Jews more generally. And that was the beginning of modern German anti-Semitism. Which means it's kind of mind boggling which means that I have to say something about circumstances and reasons. The reasons for modern German anti-Semitism are various. And I want to emphasize, I didn't talk about them at all. What gave birth to modern German anti-Semitism? What factors caused it? It's a whole different story. But the circumstances in which it was born the circumstance, the particular way in which those reasons turned into reality are also important. There are lots of things in the world which have reasons, but until the proper circumstances come together, they will not have their effect. The circumstances which allowed for the birth of modern German anti-Semitism, and I say again, from which you can draw a direct line 
to Der Sturmer and to the Holocaust are circumstances which have to do with a feud between Latinists, medievalists, about who can do better editions of medieval Latin texts. It was that feud which located Lehman eventually at Yafe's side and therefore made him an orphan rather than a scholar of medieval history when his advisor committed suicide and drove him to look for something else. And when he found that something else, that made it possible for von Treitschke to come to the catalyst for his article, which set off, set modern German anti-Semitism, respectable modern German anti-Semitism as it were, on its way. So history is a net. Things happen, you pull something here, it has its effect there. That's my first conclusion. My second conclusion is what I just said, both of them are required. My third conclusion is a methodolo methodological one about how historians should do their business. Had I shrugged off that first comma and just said, oh, it's a mistake, it shouldn't be there, none of this would have been discovered. There's a expression we use it in Hebrew, I don't know, do you use it in English? They use it in German, they use it in Hebrew about God or sometimes the devil is in the details. And basically my point is it's worthwhile following up details. Sometimes they don't pay out, sometimes they do, like in this case. And I'll leave you with this. <clears throat> this is the tombstone of Max Lehmann in Göttingen. I don't know what they had in mind when they wrote the epitaph on it, but what it says here on the bottom is, alles ist Frucht, alles Samen. Everything is fruit, everything is seed, which means there's nothing in the world which doesn't come from someplace. And there's nothing in the world which doesn't give rise to something else. And my point today is, it was a feud between German medievalists that gave rise to the Holocaust, the way it actually happened. Um, and I say, this is what I eventually wrote in that article from feuding medievalists to the Berlin antisemitism strike. Once you make that connection, everybody else has made the connection between the Berlin antisemitism strike um, and the Holocaust. Okay. So let me leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much really for a, a fascinating uh, historical um, you know, uh, journey really quite, uh, quite fascinating. I think I'm sure for everybody on, we knew very little, at least I knew very little about any of this. And uh, I was thinking, you know, right, all because of a comma. It's, uh, you know, everything because of a comma, but this is very, <laughs> very true. It's kind of in a very much less, uh, for and that's what we say, all politics is, is local. You know, what, what looks like international things often, the reasons are, you know, what goes on uh, behind the scenes. So thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, really quite, uh, quite a, re a remarkable journey. And um, uh, on the screen, on the chat box, there's not really, just somebody asking, was Lehman of any, any Jewish roots? So, <clears throat> no. With okay. I That's well, a I'm good, clear I'm answer. Glad. No commas, just a period, an exclamation no, point. So there, there's a big, much bigger answer. I said before, some of what I told you took months to discover. There are several reference books which think which write that Max Lehmann was Jewish. Uh, they're wrong. It turns out that there were two Max Lehmanns born in Berlin in 1845. <laughs> one of them was Jewish, and one of them, uh, and, and he converted to Christianity at the age of 25 or so. The other one is the one I was speaking of. I have his baptismal certificate. He was baptized a couple of weeks after he was born as was normal practice. So he was, he was born simply two different people with the same name, and this guy was never Jewish. Uh, I admit, or I will say, that when I first began this, I was all the more interested in it because I also suspected he was Jewish, and he was writing such a nasty uh, uh, review about Gretz's volume, I thought maybe he had already converted to Christianity, and this is part of his proving himself, but turned out he was not Jewish at all to begin with or, or ever. Kind of what came up on your Hanukkah talk also, it shows actually 
um, I guess the biases of academics, you know, I, I don't mean to put them down, but you know, you gotta, that's why you gotta get all angles because you know, if uh, academic is supposed to be, you know, unbiased, but we know that's impossible. Human beings can't operate like that, but it just, um, you know, kind of that, you know, he would switch his focus and his attitude just because, you know, he wanted to get a job or whatever, a new patron. It's just, uh, people uh, are people. There's a, yeah. there's a German book about the, the Monumenta, Pertz's research project. So somebody wrote a, history, a book of, uh, about the people involved in it. And the title of the book in German is Sie waren allen eben Menschen. They were all people. They were all real people with, yes, they, were, they have their intellects, they have their knowledge, they have their consciences, and they have their emotions and their jealousies, and it's all part of the world. Okay, maybe one question here quickly. Margie wants to know as if, if there are parallels today between this sort of German academic anti-Semitism and contemporary academic anti-Semitism, or are most people totally unaware of this? I mean, that... that... Most people are unaware of the story I told you. Uh, <clears throat> if I'm to judge by the, by the sales of my book on Philip Jaffe, uh, <laughs> I, I doubt that this has really swept the world's interest. Uh, uh, now and then I talk to Holocaust scholars and they, they look at it and um, why did Yaffe commit suicide? I can tell you something about that. But um, uh, there is modern anti-Semitism in academia as well. Today, typically people um, connect anti-Semitism with anti-Israelism, which is a different type of business. Um, and people debate to what extent is it anti-Semitic or anti-Israel? But um, that was something totally different from what they had in the 1870s. Uh, okay. Okay, thank After you very much. They commit suicide, probably committed suicide as I think I indicated because uh, he was a sensitive person and um, he was under attack by parrots in various ways. Uh, uh, like you saw in 1869, he publishes a public broadside calling the other guy a dishonorable man. Yes, he felt, and this is uh, no way to be treated. And he was um, doing his share of the attacking and it becomes very hard and he, to, um, to go on living like that. He was a bachelor. He was living, a, he was not very well off financially. And um, there may have been other things uh, I, I spent an awful lot of time going through archives in Germany and I found as much as I could find, but if tomorrow somebody finds something more, I'd be happy to see, to see what it is.